So as I'm sitting here listening to Carsenio for Life, sort of like an old school hip hop YouTube channel, he's talking about his beef with WAC 100. I couldn't help but notice how similar the fight game is to the rap game in terms of beef, in terms of conflict, in terms of storylines that can go on and on for days about who is affiliated with who and who is... Uh, with what group and what group supports what and what is one person's grievance over the other. In other words, just conflict, combat, and everything in between. But with that, I started to notice that MMA and boxing are becoming one and the same. And what do I mean by that? I mean that they're becoming the same culture in more ways than one. And let me explain exactly what I mean by that. For one... Boxing used to be a sport where they would have young prospects come up, take easy fights in the very beginning, and then somewhere down the line, take on harder fights when they are ready as some sort of matchup to, let's say, build a fight or build a superstar in some kind of way. Now, is there elements of this in MMA? Yes, but not so much. And this is the exact thing that I wanted to point out, is that it is no longer one of the biggest things that you can do in boxing. In fact, it's becoming a lot more old-fashioned now to somehow take on easy fights early on, whereas with a lot of guys in boxing, they're now taking on harder fights a whole lot sooner than later. And they're finding out why. You look at what happened with Spence and Crawford, and then you also take a look at what happened with Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. What had happened? You had a fight... That was five years in the making for both of them, continuously, one even a lot longer than the other. And probably that is uh, pointed towards Manny Pacquiao and uh, Floyd Mayweather, whereas with Terrence Crawford and Spence, that was sort of within a five-year span that people were looking for these two guys to fight each other, especially when Terrence Crawford decided to move up at 147 coming from being a 140 pound undisputed champion so it's very important to understand that the matchup between Crawford and Spence was not in high demand up until Crawford started beating some top names at 147 so that's really important to understand so the demand of that fight was just within maybe from the time of 2016 17 18 not even 2016 and I would probably be willing to bet as a little bit further to 2018's worth. Nonetheless, here we are. The fight has already happened. We now understand who is the top man at 147, and that is Terrence Crawford. We now understood for a long time who the top guys were in the UFC, and that is the reason why boxing is becoming a lot like MMA, and that is the reason why they are literally becoming the same sport. What do I mean by the same sport? Obviously, they're not the same sport when you step into the cage and you step into the ring and you play by a certain set of rules, whether that would be the unified rules of MMA, whether that would be the PFL rules of MMA where you're not allowed to elbow, and that's based on the fact that they have a tournament bracket that they want to preserve guys in order to bring them back months later down the road, but that's neither here or there. And then the other rule set of Japanese rules where you have a 10-minute first round, the second and third round, and maybe even later in whatever rounds they want to add into that, I think it's only three rounds max, are five minutes each after that. So that is what you have with the unified rules of MMA. They are different. And then with boxing, obviously, boxing is boxing in terms of Queensberry rules. And the other aspect of that is there are 10 standing eight counts in some states, and some states don't implement that for one reason or another. So either way, the rules and the variations that come with boxing, MMA, Muay Thai, left way, bare knuckle boxing, all of that, Yes, they differ, but outside of competition is really where the cultural differences subside. And this is the point that I'm trying to make, is that MMA and boxing are literally becoming one culture. In terms of the competition structure, because you can no longer hide in boxing. Now that the Saudis are in play, now that they are in a position to give everybody money in order to fulfill whatever it is that they need pre-fight, 
There is no more excuses, especially for the top names. Now, you're always going to have young guys that are coming up, taking on easy fights, taking on journeymen, because guess what? The backbone of boxing, which a lot of people don't know and a lot of people really look down upon to a certain degree, are the journeymen. Journeymen boxers help the upcoming guys and sometimes... Here's a little secret about boxing that many people may not know. Many of these quote-unquote journeymen are in on the job. In other words, there's times where journeymen can go out there and literally sleep the A-side fighter, the home-side fighter that paid that journeyman to come in there to basically give a show or a great account of himself and to give rounds to the young and upcoming prospect. As crazy as this sounds, this is the business of boxing, which entails, really, it ruins the competitive structure or the realism of boxing. But this is the reason why they call it professional boxing. For the same reason why professional wrestling, when wrestling was real in the 1800s, they deemed it too boring, to the point where it was unwatchable. Even people in the modern days that are watching UFC and when there is a grappling exchange involved, there are many casuals that just don't have an appetite to watch something like this. But the reality is, this is the reason why professional wrestling became professional wrestling. They decided they were going to make a show out of it, a spectacle, sometimes even to the point of exhibitions. And here's that word right there that is very common in today's boxing world, exhibition. This is what you have going on with literally a pro fight that is deemed a pro fight but has elements of an exhibition. A journeyman that is told to come in there, give a good account of himself, not sleep the other guy, may get slept himself in a process just based on the fact that they want a young guy to start learning the ropes. This is the reality of boxing. And the competitive integrity that may not even exist within that sport. Based on these facts that I just laid to you. But nonetheless, what you have going on in the modern times, in the highest level at least, because like I said, this is always going to go on on the lower levels. Now on the higher levels, a lot of guys now are going to take the big fights because it is now worth it. If the competitive architecture and the competitive integrity remains the same in terms of, okay, this is a 50-50 fight, there's a high interest that goes along with these two names, let's go with it. Let's sign it. Let's get it on. And the premier and leader of that whole entire uh, action that's being taken place with these big fights being made are the Saudis because of the money that they have and because of the amounts of wealth that they are able to produce and give away to these fighters just based on trying to build tourism in their country. So there is no hiding in boxing. Now in MMA, I haven't talked much about the competitive structure of MMA, but guess what? It's always been the complete opposite of everything that I had just mentioned in boxing. Conor McGregor is not going in to a warm-up fight. Not at all. <coughs> it would be a waste of the UFC's money to do something like that. So what do they do in the process? They give him Michael Chandler. A tough competitor, still somewhere in the top 10. But there is no guarantees that Conor McGregor is going to win this. And by the way, this is coming off of a two-year stint from an injury on top of the fact that in boxing with circumstances like this he would have been given easier fights and by the way this is where the question remains is it better to take on easier fights and then build yourself back up look at what happened with Anthony Joshua when he lost against Alexander Usyk how did he come back he came back by taking on Jermaine Franklin, by the way, a video that I had covered prior to that fight, I urge you guys to check it out on the comment section, I'm sorry, on the video and live section below of this channel, I did a coverage on that, 
take a look at some of the things that I've said leading up to that fight. But leading up to that fight, Jermaine Franklin came off of a loss from Dylan White. So not only did Anthony Joshua not want to fight the winner, and by the way, he later signed to fight Dylan White as the winner of that Jermaine Franklin and Dylan White fight, but instead chose Jermaine Franklin as a warm-up. Smart choice? Maybe. Because the next time around he came, he was supposed to fight Dylan White. That didn't happen. Instead, takes on Robert Hellenius. Gr gives a great account of himself. Only to come back and make a great account of himself once again. Against a very top Otto Wallin. Who made Tyson Fury struggle. Only for Anthony Joshua to sleep him. Well, not totally sleep him, but finish him at least in a way where the doctor had to step in and say, this is too dangerous of a fight. His mindset was perfect, and he was ready based on the fact that he had a tune-up fight leading up from the Robert Hellenius, which you can argue is also a tune-up fight. And you can also argue that it made him look like the way that he did when he faced Robert Hellenius, and from Robert Hellenius, the way that he looked great against Otto Wallin. And now going into uh, Francis Ngannou, which, by the way, some will look at as, you know what, that's a 50-50 fight. Some will just look at that and say, nah, it's not. It's another warm-up fight for AJ. But we all know what we know. We saw what happened in a Tyson Fury fight, and this is the beautiful thing about what is going on in boxing that is also going on in MMA is that there is no clear undisputed champion. Yes, you have clear undisputed championships that are going to happen on February the 17th next month with Alexander Usyk and Tyson Fury. The problem is that those two guys don't look very dominant. Guess what? In MMA, some of the top champions don't look dominant as well. And even if you look dominant and you dominate everybody like Khabib, people are going to have some sort of rebuttaling signs to say otherwise to somehow nullify that notion that you are the pound-for-pound pound number one guy in the world. So it's the same thing that is going on with boxing as it is in MMA. In other words, these two sports are becoming the same. Whereas back in the days, just like what I said, people took easy fights early on, and then the difference is, because I, like I said, they're always going to take easier fights early on in boxing. Now the only difference is that they will take higher risk for the bag that they are being offered. They are willing to risk their losing streak. They are willing to risk their undefeated records. They are willing to risk losing their belts all for the bag because that was the main problem that they had in the very beginning was that they didn't understand who the bigger A side was and which guy was going to get paid the most based on this fight being in high demand and knowing that they were going to generate a lot of money from it. So guess what? The A-side wanted to have the clear and bigger percentage just to show that they were the higher contributors to the attraction of these particular events. Well, the Saudis came in and said, no more. That's not how it's going to go down. We're going to pay everybody just so we can find out who the best is in the world and just so the Saudis can show that they have the best tourism commercials in the world. Look at what they did with the Francis Ngannou and Tyson Fury fight. The production that they had going on with that. And then you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, look at the card that they did with Anthony Joshua and Otto Wallin, an all-star card. A type of card that the UFC could put on virtually almost every four months within a major pay-per-view. That's what the Day of Reckoning was. But that's not something that is common in boxing where you have these big stars that are filling up the cards from top to bottom. So Day of Reckoning was literally an example of UFC 100, which by the way, was a card full of Hall of Famers. UFC 200, which by the way, was a card full of Hall of Famers. And UFC 300, which unfortunately, a lot of people are doubting there's going to be bigger names to it, just based on the fact that the UFC has now reached a high level of prestige that they may not even have to worry about really filling up this Super Bowl-like event that is known as UFC 300. They don't have to try as hard. So they can put on a fight 
like Bilal Muhammad and Leon Edwards and symbolically to show that, you know what, by the end of the day, this is a hardcore fan sport. It may not be the two most popular guys, but what we have are the two best guys at the 170 division in the current moment, which is Bilal Muhammad and Leon Edwards. And that is what we want ultimately as hardcore fight fans. Yes, as a casual, maybe it's a little bit different. You have different desires and the different types of names that you want to see. Maybe you want to see Deontay Wilder somewhere in that mix. Maybe you want to see somebody else take on Leon Edwards other than Bilal Muhammad if you're not satisfied with the rightful competitive architecture that is going on with that particular matchup. Maybe you want another matchup that goes beyond just, let's say, superstar fandom, but rather the integrity of the sport and the competitive architecture that belongs in the sport.